flower information, for example, would be the, the one that's uh, important. But different crops have different critical windows. So, okay, I will start with um, a summary of uh, yield determination based on two ideas. One is resources, wooden and nitrogen in particular. But also this idea that uh, Greg uh, put forward for uh, May before. Stress early in the season or late in the season would have minor impact. Stay, uh, stress around flower information, for example, would be the, the one that's uh, important. But different crops have different critical windows. So, um, and then we will concentrate on the two main resources, wood and nitrogen we we'll see uh, in some cases there are synergies. When breeders, and, and Greg showed that as well, when breeders select for yield with the same uptake of water or with the same background rainfall with similar inputs of nitrogen, the two efficiencies increase. So yield drives the, the efficiencies. But when we look at, uh, for example, uh, nitrogen, there is a clear and very strong trade-off. With more nitrogen, we increase the wood efficiency but there's a penalty, the nitrogen use efficiency in growth, so we cannot maximize both. Um, two uh, disclaimers. I will talk mostly about wheat, but I will touch on another uh, few crops through the talk uh, to bring uh, some ideas to reinforce similarities and uh, highlight differences. And the second uh, disclaimer that uh, I'm coming from this uh, southern region with a winter rainfall pattern, which makes uh, cropping uh, a very different business to, to cropping here. And that relates to the, uh, these aspects of rainfall in Australia. That's the seasonality. So what this arrow shows uh, show are two things. One, a long arrow shows strong seasonality. So we have strong seasonality here. Here the arrows are just dot equal frequent, uh, amount of rainfall through the, the 12 months of the year, and then we have seasonality again down south. And the direction where these arrow points, say for example here or here, that's the time of the year when you have the, the peak rainfall. That's uh, uh, early, in early January, February. That's the summer rainfall, and then it shifts. If you see where that arrow is pointing out, that's July. And what this means is the menu of cropping options are very different. And uh, for growing wheat, we have a very, very different picture. Uh, in this type of northern environments with summer rainfall, a good, there's a good chance that you would start the season with a reasonably wet profile. So there's a component of risk that you can take uh, into consideration just by measuring water. In the south is the mirror image. We start our season with uh, pretty much dry soils and the majority of water is in-season rainfall. So growing wheat in these southern environments is much more risky. Okay. Um, uh, the growth of crops and yield depends on the uh, ability of the crop to capture resources and to use resources with a certain efficiency to produce biomass. So the resources are four. Water and nutrients, and we... Uh, and that's probably the focus of more uh, research and management. But there's also an aspect of uh, CO2 and radiation that we get for granted because we don't pay for them. But water and nutrients can be stored in the soil, so today's rainfall could be used next week. But the radiation that's lost today is, is gone forever. So that's, we don't pay for it, but there's an opportunity cost. All the other factors, temperature, day length, insects, soil constraints, what they do is they modulate the ability of the crop to capture the four resources. I will show you only one example about uh, the importance of radiation. These are three uh, summer crops, maize, uh, soybean, and sunflower. The question is what are the yield benefits or, or penalties of uh, narrow and, and wide spacing? And these crops are either irrigated or rain-fed, but they have, even the rain-fed one uh, uh, crops had good water supply at flowering. So this is a comparison of the, uh, all, the, all the trials together. So this is th uh, three crop species. This is the yield increase in narrow rows. So if the, 
if a crop with wild rows was intercepting 100% of radiation, there's no benefit in narrow rows. But here the crop with uh, wide rows is intercepting only 60% of the radiation, so there is a 10, 12, 15% increase in yield with narrow rows. That's what uh, Graham was showing in, in terms of a trade-off. When you have a, a good condition, the, the narrow rows would give you, or skip, or solid would give you the higher yield, and that's essential because the crop can capture more radiation. And, and what this perspective helps us is to uh, understand why one season we might have one response and next season another one. Uh, here we are plotting biomass and resources. So this could be water, radiation, or nitrogen. And a crop that's unstressed will uh, grow in proportion to how much water the crop is capturing or nitrogen. If the crop is stressed, there are two things that happen. One is this, the crop with smaller canopy will capture less water, less nitrogen, less radiation. So, and the other thing that might change is this, the, the slope is the efficiency in the use of the resource, efficiency in the use of water or nitrogen or radiation. And that might drop if the stress is uh, extreme. But of the two, this is the more important. So to show that uh, how it uh, works in, in uh, agronomic situation. These are wheat crops in the Mali, sandy soils. Down here, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 centimeters, there's a compacted layer. The roots don't go through that, so there's no much access to water and nitrogen. This treatment was, uh, uh, the soil was a deep tillage, and that's how the crops look up there. When we measure the amount of radiation captured by the two crops, so the control with uh, subsoil uh, compaction was capturing less than 20% of radiation, the other crop was capturing 40. So the stress starts in the soil, <coughs> but you see how, how that has an impact on, on capture of life. And at the end of the day, that's what reducing the yield. So this is a loop that tries to represent that, that uh, soil stress. This could be compaction, but it would be extreme pH acidity, alkalinity, it could be boron toxicity, it could be salinity, whatever is affecting the root growth. So the roots are not growing because there is a soil stress. And that reduces the capture of water and nutrients. Because there is less water and nutrients, the roots grow less. So here we have a reinforcing loop that starts with the soil stress. But because there is water and nutrient deficit, the shoot also grows less. It's the, the crop is nitrogen deficient, as we see with compaction, or it's water deficient. So the, the, the canopy is smaller, and the capture of radiation and CO2 is also affected. And there's an, another loop here, and this is the final loop. Because the canopies are smaller, the roots do have less resources. They have less carbon and energy to grow. So that's the loop of forest stress growth. Mm -hmm. So it might, the stress might start in the soil with any factor, but once it's established, the crop is, um, is going to be in this loop. And one of the implications of this is that even if the, the, the crop is stressed because of, uh, say, compaction, the crop can still respond to water or nitrogen or, or other factors. Um, this is the dynamics of uh, the yield component of a wheat crop. So what we have is shoots, tillers that are produced, and at some stage the tillers go through this stage of mortality. So the number of heads per meter at the end is not defined by how many uh, tillers are uh, developed, but for this mortality stage. The second component of grain number is how many grains per spike the plant produces. And there's a similar <coughs> dynamic. The plant overproduces florets, and then there's this mortality stage. And here is grain field in the second uh, year component. But this window here, a few weeks before flowering, is the critical one because that's where the mortality of uh, heads and, and uh, grains per spike are, are uh, occurring. So we've seen Graham show the different patterns of stress. So that's from the viewpoint of the environment. From the viewpoint of the crop, what we want through management is to reduce the probability of this critical stage 
to hit a, a, a high probability of, of water stress, for example. So, yield is a function of grain number that applies to all crops. And in the case of wheat, grain number is defined in this window between stem elongation and a week or so after flowering. Crop management, therefore, should target a high growth rate in this window. Because we grow crops both in the south and here with limited amount of water, we often think of saving water for grain filling. But I think certainly in the south, I'm, I'm not sure here, I think that uh, viewpoint has been overemphasized and we're missing the real uh, point of uh, grain number. <coughs> so this is a classical experiment with uh, wheat, this, where plants are grown with uh, low or high density. This is outside the economic range, but we need a log scale to accommodate this uh, drop from 1,000 grains to 10 grains. In this range, so it's uh, several orders of magnitude, the crop is dropping seed number, but look at seed size, it's a 7% difference. So the crop accommodates environmental variation through number. And that's the variation in yield of uh, a number of wheat crops, all the range of uh, yield you could find. 80% of the variation in yield is grain number. Grain size is the rest. We, of course, want uh, good healthy grain. We don't want uh, screenings. But chasing uh, grain filling means we might be missing opportunities here. If we're looking at two-fold increase in yield from two to four tons, from four to eight, that must be grain number. And that's pre-flowering. So what we need is a crop that grows well before flowering. That takes us to this idea of uh, critical windows. And the way we measure that experimentally is with uh, uh, this sort of uh, shading. We set uh, a treatment like that for a couple of weeks, and then we move the shade to the next spot. And at the end of the season, we uh, measure the uh, grain set. With that type of experiment, Tony Fisher determined the window of uh, critical response to stress for wheat. And you see that. So early in the season, late in the season, there's no response to stress. The critical window is sometime here, 40 days before flowering, 10 days after flowering. Stem elongation to a week after flowering. That's the most critical window uh, for stress uh, response of wheat. We've seen kernel number is the critical component, and this is the response of kernel number. We just done this for chickpeas, which is an important crop in the north. One thing that's uh, surprising for us is that for early season stress, we still have a, a drop in yield. But the critical point for uh, chickpeas is uh, 200 or so degree days after flowering. That's similar to other legumes. But you can see again, all the variation in yield is accounted for seed number. Seed size is not responding, or in proportion is, is secondary. And this is a comparison of the critical windows for different crops. We've seen maize with a very sharp uh, uh, sensitivity to stress at flowering. Wheat is that uh, same elongation to two weeks after, f or one week after flowering, as we've seen. Uh, soybean and other legumes have a, a, a critical period that's a bit after flowering. So managing crops is about what uh, Graham showed before, we have a pattern of stress. How do we manage the sowing depth, density, and so forth to avoid stress in these critical windows or to reduce the probability of stress hitting the crop in the, in the most sensitive stage? Um, this is another idea that's uh, put forward first by Tony Fisher. This is the number of kernels, and this is the ratio of radiation and temperature. So high radiation gives you more yield because it's more photosynthesis, but high temperature shortens the time when the crop is producing grain, and, and that's how high, why high temperature reduces yield potential. And with that idea, that explains why uh, early sowing, so this is a measure of yield potential, and that's the time of flowering for weeding a transect from horse to emerald. And you see, with late flowering, yield potential drops. That's because we have that relation of radiation and temperature. But essentially, high temperature is what's 
drop in the, the EU potential. And of course, we need to look at that in the, in the, against the, the risk of frost. But we can explain the effect of sowing date through this radiation temperature ratio on yield potential. <coughs> so whenever possible, early flowering will give you the highest yield potential. So we've seen that grain number is the most important yield component in which is defined in this window. So let's have a look now at the components of grain number, heads and uh, grains per head. So this is wheat uh, here. This is the number of green tillers and leaf number. And probably agronomic densities might be between this and that. But you see the, the start of mortality well before uh, flag leaf. So the heads are overproduced. Some of them are killed, and that's before flowering. This is an interesting uh, study in the West uh, with a range of rainfall from 300 to 700 millimeters, different locations, soils, management varieties. And this is an interesting rule of thumb, which I'm not sure whether it's been tested or, or, or tried here. What they find is for each additional uh, mill of rainfall, for them rainfall is uh, same as in South Australia, the main source of water but you can do the calculation with uh, soil water plus rainfall. And that's an interesting number. There's one more head that can be supported for each additional meal of rainfall. The next uh, aspect of um, grain number is how many uh, grains per head the plant can support. And this is the critical window be be between stem elongation and flowering for wheat. You see again oil production of florets and the mortality. So that's what's happening when we open a head. So these florets are developing okay to produce eventually a grain, but many of them are aborting like that. And that depends on the environment again. And again, this is happening at the time when the crop is, uh, the crop is killing both heads and it's killing uh, florets and at the same time is storing sugar uh, or ca carbohydrates in the stem. It's all happening in those two, three weeks before flowering. So that's what's happening there. Uh, these are experiments we've done in uh, South Australia, different locations. Here we ask the question about summer rainfall, which is least frequent and growers ask whether it's worth doing something to conserve that water and different stubble and different nitrogen rates. The point back to what we said before, yield is a function of grain number. 80% of the variation in yield between two and seven tons is accounted for grain number. And what drives the grain number here is the growth rate of the crop between stem elongation and flowering. So if the crop has more resources, better conditions, it grows faster, it sets more grain. So having a crop with good supply of nutrients, water, and so forth, pre-flowering is what make, it's making the difference in, in uh, grain set and yield. This is another example. That's a field piece. 29 varieties and 10 environments. Yield related to seed number, unrelated to seed size, and seed number is related to the growth rate of the crop in the window when, when grain, grain number is set. And these are examples, uh, Greg showed this for maize, growth rate of, an, of the plant and the number of grains set um, per plant. So it's again, for each crop there's a critical window, it might be a bit early or a bit later, but the growth rate, how uh, healthy the crop is, how able the crop is to capture the resources, is what's going to drive grain number and, and eventually yield. And here, this is interesting, you can see this is uh, a ceiling for maize with one uh, cob, and this is a prolific hybrid that can produce with good conditions the second cob. Okay, so yield is a function of grain number. Grain number is defined in a critical window that depends on the crop, so crop management should target a high growth rate in this window. There might be risks. We might run out of water if we have high growth rate early, but the point is how we manage that balance. If we try to be, if we are too conservative to save water, 
to ensure Greek feeling, we might be losing opportunities to get uh, high yields. We've seen the environments before, and um, just to highlight that for wheat, this is the, the real killer. This is the drought that would get uh, most of the yield uh, losses. And, and see where it starts. So we start to see the def deficit of water 400 degrees before flowering. So it's stem elongation to flowering that's really causing the, the greatest yield, yield uh, penalties. Yes, of course, we have a terminal drought here, grain feeding will be affected, but it really doesn't matter because the yield was lost here already. Um, let's have a look at uh, water and nitrogen now with these uh, concepts of trade-offs and synergies. This is a comparison of wheats released in uh, Australia over the last 50 years. These are southern and western varieties. I highlighted Holbert. That's the variety that uh, French and Schultz use for the uh, benchmark of 20 kilos per hectare per millimeter. And, uh, and it's uh, a while ago that that, uh, that variety has been uh, the dominant one. The varieties are, uh, in this collection, they are selected because they've been used uh, widely. There's no phenological trend. There's some difference in phenology, but it's not that the new varieties are shorter or, or, or later. So that's, uh, over the century, how yield per unit water has increased. So that's halberd, 20 kilos per hectare per millimeter in the 60s. Current varieties in the south are close to 25. So we need to update our benchmark to account for the new varieties. And that's essentially higher yield, har uh, harvest index is higher with the same water use, so that's why the water efficiency is increasing. An interesting aspect of this uh, comparison is that when we look at nitrogen, this is a nitrogen uptake of the different varieties. So you see the new varieties are able to get more nitrogen from the soil. And that's been found in the UK as well and with maize in the USA. So pressure to, to get higher yield is improving these sort of uh, traits related to the nitrogen economy of the crop. So new crops or new varieties need more nitrogen. And we see that when we have good conditions for yield, many new varieties are uh, quite poor in terms of grain protein. So we need to certainly adjust nitrogen to account for the new varieties. And that's a case of uh, what we say the synergy. Selection for yield has improved both uh, the nitrogen and the water economies of the crops. So it's a win-win situation. <coughs> Let's have a look at the trade-off related to nitrogen fertilizer now. So that's the yield and water use of the black points are crops in the Mali, again. And you can see this is ceiling, about two tons. The, the green points are model uh, data, assuming low nitrogen. When we model the system with more nitrogen, the gap is narrower. So a good part of this ceiling that we see in these systems is because in the good seasons, there's no enough nitrogen in the system. And that's because the soils have low nitrogen, uh, low organic matter, but also because of the risk that's involved in, in these risky environments, getting more nitrogen in, in, in as fertilizer. Um, so the reasons why um, nitrogen is required to, to close this gap so here we see higher water efficiency, high yield with the same water, with more nitrogen. One of the reasons is that there is a reduced soil evaporation. So this is canola in the Wimera with no fertilizer, 120 millimeters of soil evaporation with a high rate. There's a marked uh, drop in soil evaporation. Here in the north, this might be less important. But you still need nitrogen to have high uh, photosynthesis and water efficiency. Another thing that might happen in a crop that's nitrogen deficient is that the crop might be unable to, to get all the water from the soil. It's not common, but sometimes we can find uh, residual water at, at maturity in crops that have been uh, limited by nitrogen. So you need nitrogen to get the most of the water. But with more nitrogen, 
because the responsive field to nitrogen has this shape, each unit of nitrogen is giving you less return in terms of grains, uh, grain yield per, per nitrogen. And that's why we have this trade-off driven by, by fertilizer. The more uh, fertilizer we use, wood use efficiency increases, but there's a drop in nitrogen use efficiency. So when we see growers in the south or that are working at sort of 70% of the maximum wood use efficiency, uh, it might be what they're doing is managing, the, managing this trade-off. This doesn't make uh, economic sense to go for the rates of nitrogen that are required to maximize wood use efficiency because you have this penalty here. And that's hardwired in the physiology of the crops. All crops will have this nitrogen-driven trade-off between the two efficiencies. So to show that, that's an example with the maize in the USA. More nitrogen, what is efficiency goes up, nitrogen is efficiency goes down. That's rice, more nitrogen, water is efficiency goes up, and the nitrogen is efficiency goes down. There's no way around that. So management of nitrogen is to some extent managing this trade-off. So to finish up, this, um, um, I think this is an important aspect of, of uh, water and nitrogen. So we often try to look at water and nitrogen uh, separately, and in particular in breeding, trying to improve one or the other. But uh, in reality, we cannot separate water and nitrogen. So we need nitrogen to have a high water efficiency, but with high nitrogen input, there is a low uh, efficiency in the return for uh, nitrogen, and there is a risk associated with that. And to summarize this idea of uh, critical periods, if I'm given one dollar to improve yield of wheat through agronomy breeding, that's how I would invest that. It's important to get the crop in, it's important to have a, a good finish, but that's the window where we will have uh, the greatest return for investment. That's where we need to focus on. Thank you.